Hi, true crime fans. You're tuning into Coffee, Murder, and Mystery, a true crime podcast where we discuss murder, mystery, and the supernatural. Don't forget to hit subscribe. I'm Melissa, and I'm podcasting solo today. I do want to start with a trigger warning. This episode includes violence against children. I also wanted to say thank you to all the new listeners. We have international listeners, new listeners from the UK, South Africa, Canada, the Netherlands, and Russia. And in the United States, we've had a lot of listeners in California, Texas, Virginia, New York, and we have a lot of other states where we have one or two listeners, and we really, really hope it grows. Of course, we've had a lot of listeners from Michigan. We're from Michigan, so that makes sense. We wanted to say thank you to all of our listeners. You're really helping our podcast grow. We're really working hard at getting better at this and giving you longer content, more detailed content. If you have any missing persons that you would like to be featured on our episodes, please email us at coffeecigarettesandmurder at gmail.com. We will be happy to feature as many people as we can, first come, first serve basis, and missing persons. And I also wanted to let you guys know about the name change. We did have to change the name. It was Coffee, Cigarettes, and Murder. It is now Coffee, Murder, and Mystery. Unfortunately... Some people thought we were promoting tobacco and we couldn't do some advertising and things that would be really critical to helping our podcast grow. So we did have to change that. Today for our story, we take you back to the 80s. Hey Mickey and Hungry Like a Wolf were on the radio. Hacky sacks were becoming the hot thing with teens, along with leotards and mixed match socks. I came from the 80s and that time will always hold a special candle in my heart. But like all good times, there were also bad times. The yin and the yang. Psychology Today has stated that when a mother kills her children, filicide, it's usually due to one of five motives. Number one is altruism, the feeling that she is doing her children a favor, saving them from something, abuse, poverty, the world ending. The second is acute psychosis, a profound break with reality delusions, hallucinations, sometimes both. The third is accidents, but these accidents are as a result of the mother's actions, such as abuse or Munchausen's. Fourth is revenge. This reason is more often found in men than women, but some women will kill their children to hurt their spouse. Although the four reasons I have listed for you are unimaginable, awful, and disgusting, Today, we will be talking about what is, in my opinion, the worst. Number five, unwanted child. There are times that a mother simply no longer wants their child as they feel they are getting in the way of the life they want. Selfish beasts. Diane was brought into this world bearing the name Elizabeth Diane Fredrickson. She was born on August 7, 1955. This makes her a Leo, and according to astrology-zodiac-zines.com, people born on this day are fast, energetic, and hasty. This is a time of special curves and turns in the zodiac, and anything is possible. People born on this day often forget the past and their approach to future endeavors. Diane seemed to have a pretty basic childhood, aside from some moving around until about the age of 11, when her father obtained a job as a postal worker and the family put down roots in Phoenix, Arizona. Diane does allege that her father sexually abused her at the age of 12. Diane was about 14 years old when she started rebelling. Cutting and dyeing her hair, she dropped the Elizabeth from her name. She no longer wanted to be viewed as little Elizabeth Diane Fredrickson. She wanted to be seen as an adult, Diane. She met her future husband in high school, Steve Downs. After high school, Steve enlisted in the Navy and Diane enrolled in the Pacific Coast Bible College in California. They did throw her out after just a year for promiscuous behavior. This was the first documented time that she cheated on Steve. Diane's parents were never big fans of Steve and strongly disapproved of their relationship. They had high hopes for Diane's future, but in their minds, her future was without Steve. 
Despite this, 18-year-old Diane ran away from home. On November 1973, Steve and Diana became Mr. and Miss Downs. Their marriage is portrayed as dramatic and full of infidelity. Three children entered the world during their marriage. Christy, age 8, Cheryl, age 7, and Danny, Steve and Daniel, age 3. After just seven years of marriage in 1980, Steve would leave Diana. Believing Danny, Steve and Daniel, was not his child and was a product of an affair that Diane had had. Diane had one more pregnancy by Steve that did end in abortion, which is something Diane expressed regret about later. After the divorce, it seems like Diane's life was changing. Diane's job at the post office reassigned her to an Oregon location where her father was postmaster. She did relocate and take her children with her. Diane saw a couple on TV looking for a surrogate. The wife not conceive and Diane volunteered her services to the couple. Diane gave birth to the couple's baby girl on May 8, 1982. The parents were overjoyed and Diane felt like she had helped the family and would state later that she had no regrets in doing this. While Diane was married and living in Arizona, she had multiple affairs, but the most notable was with Robert Knickerbocker. Robert and his wife were separated, and Diana fell hard for Knickerbocker, seducing him and trying to get him to leave his wife for good and start a life with her. Knickerbocker would report that Diane even stalked him at times. He had made it clear that he didn't want children or a family life. Robert Knickerbocker was relieved when Diane was relocated to Oregon so that she would no longer stand in the way of him amending his marriage with his wife. Diane would write him letters almost daily, but he would return them unopened. She wanted Robert to leave his wife and come live in Oregon with her so they could make a life together. Robert would later tell police that he felt that Diane was so obsessed that she was willing to kill his wife if needed in order to be with him. Robert had come clean with his wife about the affair, and she did support him throughout the trial. Diane had been visiting with a friend on the evening of May 19, 1983, and was supposedly on her way home at 10 p.m. that night when tragedy struck. She showed up at the local hospital emergency room with one deceased and two critically wounded children in the backseat of the car. All three children had been critically wounded by gunshot. The hospital staff recalls the tears of the emergency staff as they ran out to the car to pull the children into the emergency room and start life-saving treatments. They did not have enough emergency personnel staffed that night in this quiet Oregon town. Dr. Stephen Wilhite had just returned to his home from a day at work when his beeper went off. He raced back to the hospital so fast he cut the travel time in half. Upon arriving, he found that Cheryl, age 7, had unfortunately passed away. Christy, age 8, and Danny, age 3, were fighting for their lives. As he walked over to Christy to assist with life-saving procedures, his first thought was that the child was already gone. Her blood pressure was basically non-existent. The life appeared to be gone from her eyes, but she was still there. He said although she was still alive, death was starting to set in. With the combination of hard work, skill, and miracles, they were able to bring the little girl back. But she had suffered a stroke due to lack of blood pressure that would leave her with a slow recovery and unable to speak for quite a long period of time. Danny, it seems, they were able to stabilize more quickly, but he had a bullet lodged in his back in a spot that would leave him paralyzed from the waist down. Diane's original story of what happened that night reads something like this. Diane and the children were driving home from the friend's house at 10 p.m., and the family took some back roads to go sightseeing. As they were driving down a rural road lined with trees that ran alongside a river, a man on foot flagged Diane down. She stopped the car and exited the vehicle to ask him what he needed. He stated that he wanted her car. And according to Diane, the conversation went a little like this. I stopped and got out and asked him what was the problem. He said, I want your car. And I said, gee, I'd be kidding. I mean, how many people really do that in real life? They don't. 
He then proceeded to lean into the car and shoot her children before turning back to her for a small altercation where she pushed him and possibly kicked him. Diane was shot in the arm and a second shot missed her totally. But thinking fast, Diane decided to pretend to throw her keys. As the attacker ran after them, she drove her children as fast as she could to the hospital, where, as I said earlier, the staff found Cheryl, age 7, to be deceased, Christy, 8, to be on the verge of death, and Danny, 3, to have a bullet lodged in his back that would most likely leave him paralyzed for life. I do have some audio here of Diane discussing the incident. We were just out, I guess, sightseeing, I guess you'd say. And the kids got tired. They fell asleep in the car. So I decided to just head on home. But I saw a road I hadn't been on before. We like to take back roads. And just went down that road. And there was a guy standing in the road, flagging me down. So I stopped. Everything was done in a matter of five or 10 seconds. He swung himself around and fired twice. One caught me in the arm. The other one, I went off somewhere. Danny cried the whole way. I could hear him softly just moaning in Christy was dying. God, the, all the blood, all the pain. Everyone was immediately put off by Diane's lack of emotion. The only person that wasn't crying in the hospital was Diane. When the emergency staff recounts that day, they remember the entire staff in tears for these children. When the doctor went to talk to Diane about her daughter Christy's condition, Diane seemed emotionless. Dr. Wilhite stated that Diane told him that the shooting really ruined her new car by getting blood all over the back of it. He was shocked when Diane told him that she knew Christy was brain dead and that she just wanted him to pull the plug. But he informed her that the girl was going to make it and be okay and they don't just pull the plug on recovering patients. It was then that the doctor went to a judge and it was ordered that he and one other doctor would be Christy's guardians so that they could treat her in a way that they felt medically necessary for her health. One thing that they had noticed was that when Diane came into Christy's room, all of her vitals spiked and they felt that she was experiencing fear. I have another audio clip of a statement from Diane that demonstrates the lack of emotion the hospital staff was talking about. I just kept saying, God, do what's that? You know, if they got to die, let them die, but don't let them suffer. That was a little hard to understand, so if you didn't catch it, Diane says, if they've got to die, they've got to die, but just please don't let them suffer. During normal questioning, police had asked Diane about the gun she owned. She disclosed that she owned a 12-gauge shotgun, but did not tell them that she also owned a 22 caliber pistol. When they spoke to Diane's husband, Steve Downs, he was aware that she did own a 22 and did report this to police. It was known that she kept this 22 in the trunk of her car so that the kids did not find it and play with it. Police were not able to locate the 22. And a 22 just happened to be the exact type of gun that the children were shot with. Although they were not able to find the gun, they were able to find unfire casings in her home. These casings had extractor markings matching the murder weapon. Police originally asked Diane to give a video reenactment of what happened to her that night. If you Google this, you can watch the video clip. I do have the audio here for you, but she is having a great time. One of her children has just passed away. The other two are in critical condition and Diane is laughing and loving every moment of being on the camera. She's loving the attention that the police are giving her by having her reenact what happened to her when her daughter was murdered and the other two critically injured. This seemed to really be the thing that got everyone's attention and made them think something was wrong with Diane's story. Here's the audio from that reenactment. Like that. I got in the car, jumped in, put the keys in. God, I just hit my cat! started the car and left. The car door shut itself. God. As Christy recovered, a therapist worked with her on what had happened to her. Christy was not healed enough to speak yet and was not comfortable talking about what happened or writing it. But one thing was clear, she did remember the shooting. The therapist had Christy write the name of her shooter on a piece of paper and put it into an envelope and seal it. She was to throw the paper into the fireplace and burn it. They practiced this over and over again until Christy was comfortable enough and strong enough to let the therapist read the paper. 
A witness came forward and stated that he saw Diane driving on her route to the hospital. Despite her claims that she was driving like a bat out of hell to get those children to the hospital, he estimated her speed to be between 5 and 7 miles an hour. He was actually fairly annoyed and trying to pass her, but it was a no-passing zone. The public was demanding an arrest. Everyone wanted to see Diane behind bars, but there wasn't enough evidence. The detective stated that he could not watch Diane Downs be acquitted of this crime, and he would wait as long as he had to to get a conviction. And what they needed was poor Christy to recover enough to testify and tell them who had shot her, her sister, and her brother. That day did eventually come, and Christy was ready to tell them that her mother had shot the three of them on that horrific night. Nine months after Diane committed this atrocious crime, she was arrested. It was February 28, 1984, and she was pregnant and in her third trimester with another child. When the prosecuting attorney started his opening statements, Diane Downs had a hard time not talking herself into a hole. She wrote lie on a notepad and held it up for the prosecutor to see. It is said that there was silence in the courtroom when Christy walked in, healed enough mentally and physically to testify against her own mother, putting her away and allowing her, her brother, and the baby Diane was carrying to live the rest of their lives out safely. Diane had three diagnoses. One, narcissistic personality disorder, which is a mental condition where people have an inflative sense of their importance. A deep need for excessive attention, they have troubled relationships, and a lack of empathy for others. Two, histronic personality disorder. These people tend to be dramatic and theatrical. They have an overwhelming desire to be noticed. They behave inappropriately to get attention. And her third diagnosis was antisocial personality disorder. With this mental condition, people often disregard right and wrong. They manipulate others. They ignore their rights and feelings for their own benefit. I have a few more clips of audio that I wanted to play for you that I think just really show Diane's mental capacity. And I also wanted to note that you can find the link to the audio as a reference in our show notes. Everybody says you sure were lucky. Well, I don't feel very lucky. I couldn't tie my damn shoes for about two months. It is very painful. It is still painful. The scar is going to be there forever. I'm going to remember that night for the rest of my life, whether I want to or not. I don't think I was very lucky. I think my kids were lucky. If I had been shot the way they were, we all would have died. This man shot my daughter. My first reaction was to snap back to my childhood, to the pain that had happened to me back then, my marriage, my entrapment by society. This man was bigger than me. He was stronger than me. He had more power because he had a gun. And I stood there and I looked at Christy reaching and the blood that just kept gushing out of her mouth. And, and I, what do you do? On September 26, 1988, Diane Downs and Anne Rule were guests on the Oprah Winfrey Show. Diane attending remotely from prison. Anne Rule had wrote a book called Small Sacrifices, The True Story of Diane Downs. I recently read the book and loved it, so this is my recommendation. If you Google Diane Downs and Oprah, you can watch this video and it's basically them continuously arguing. Diane is telling Anne that she disagrees with everything that she wrote and Anne had no knowledge of anything going on to write it. She even stated that Anne never came to interview her in prison. But then when Anne and Oprah actually gave the date that Anne went to interview her in prison, she said, oh, but that was just 20 minutes. Discounting the interview as if it didn't happen. Anne Rule did comment on Diane's inability to stop speaking as a reference point for the book. Anne recalled the time when Diane was on the stand and asked the court if they would like to know the names of and ways that she met all of her lovers. The court responded with that will not be necessary and Diane proceeded to tell them this information anyway. Anne informed her that it's things like that that gave her all of the information that she needed for the book. 
Anne Rule, a former police officer, did her due diligence in writing this book. She sat through every day of the entire trial and interviewed everyone necessary to really get a feel of what was going on in the Diane Down story. There was also a 1989 made-for-TV movie based upon the book Small Sacrifices, and it's the same name. You can find it on YouTube. July 11th, 1987. Diane climbed the 12-foot prison fence using clothing to protect herself from the barbed wire on top and jumped down to freedom. The guards apparently weren't looking when this happened. In case you were wondering, I know I was. She did go to a fellow inmate's husband's house. He lived near the prison, and although him and his wife were not on speaking terms, Wayne Seifer let Diane in the door no questions asked. She said, can I stay? And he said, sure, and went back to bed. A few hours later, Diane introduced herself, not with her name, but as a girl with no clothes on, and went on to have a sexual relationship with Wayne, who was at the time a heroin addict. With no leads, they were looking for Diane as far as Wisconsin. They were concerned she might try to seek out her children and hurt them. Police went back to the penitentiary to look through Diane's property and found some blank stationery, but it had impressions on it from the map that Diane had drawn showing her how to get to Wayne's house from the prison. And that was how they found Diane 10 days after she escaped. In 1989, Downs had a boyfriend, Robert Seaver, while she was incarcerated. He took a voluntary polygraph test, although I did not find what prompted this polygraph. But the conclusion of this polygraph was basically that Downs was trying to come up with another way to escape, and they had talked about numerous possible escape plans together, some involving helicopters. Diane denied the escape plan, but did admit that her and Robert were calculating a plan to attempt to impregnate Diane using a primitive artificial insemination method while she was incarcerated. Anne recently gave an interview about COVID going through the prison that she's in. The California prison was on lockdown because of the virus, and she compared the virus to the Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe. To me, this just seemed another reason for Diane to get into the spotlight. Becky Babcock grew up with a normal childhood. She knew she was adopted, but it wasn't until she tricked a babysitter into telling her her mother's last name, that her life started to spiral into a dark place. Her adopted family did not want her to know, or at least not until she was older, that she was the baby that Diane was pregnant with during her trial. She wanted to know her birth mother. She felt a connection with this woman whom she had never met. She felt she needed to know where she came from, and eventually she started writing Diane. Becky stated at first the letters were normal correspondence that you would expect in such a situation. But after a short period of time, the letters started turning strange. And she said that you could see the mental illness coming through the letters she was writing. Diane eventually accused Becky of being part of the conspiracy against her. Becky was eventually able to come to terms with sharing DNA with her mother and moved on to become a behavioral health coordinator. She did not continue to speak to Diana. She embraced her adoptive family that has always loved and cared for her and given her everything that she has needed in life. Christy and Danny have also moved on with their lives. They were adopted and raised by the prosecuting attorney on the case and are said to be living very private but normal, happy lives as adults. Diane was found guilty on all counts, murder, attempted murder, and assault. And it was required that she serve 25 years before being eligible for parole, which to this day has been denied. She did have five years added on to her sentence for her escape. It seemed clear at the trial that the intention was for her to never be released back into society. And we can only hope that that intention remains. And that concludes our podcast episode for today. And we will see you with a new episode on Wednesday. Bye now.
Thank you for tuning in to Copy, Murder, and Mystery. A true crime.